I'm Tracy Sable tonight on EWTN News Nightly, setting the stage. Vice President Harris and former President Trump are in the final hours before their debate tomorrow night. We have a preview from presidential campaigns expert Todd Belt getting ready to vote. As lawmakers return to Capitol Hill, Republicans say they have concerns about security and the November elections. Message to young people. During his apostolic trip, the Holy Father delivers a reminder about the best way to overcome hatred. Plus, underway in Ecuador. A report from the capital city as the International Eucharistic Congress begins with mass. These stories and more tonight. From EWTN, the Global Catholic Network, this is EWTN News Nightly. Thank you for being with us on the Feast of St. Peter Claver. Our top story tonight, election 2024, the race to the White House. Just ahead of tomorrow night's presidential debate, Kamala Harris reveals her policy positions and, as expected, abortion is listed as a key part of her platform. She promises to, quote, never allow a national abortion ban to become law. White House correspondent Owen Jensen reports. Good evening, Tracy. We've been awaiting this moment when Vice President Kamala Harris would put her presidential agenda in writing. She calls her list a new way forward. But when it comes to abortion, you'll see it's more of the same. The Harris campaign website now includes the issues she cares about, including a section labeled Restore and Protect Reproductive Freedoms. The Harris campaign writes, when Congress passes a bill to restore reproductive freedom nationwide, she will sign it. The vice president's husband, also on the campaign trail promoting abortion, Douglas Emhoff, appeared at an event in Raleigh, North Carolina. But since we're here talking about the fight for reproductive freedom, she just wanted me to remind you all to fight for it, to actually fight for it. And the one way we can fight for it is by helping her become the next president of the United States. Tomorrow night, Harris will have to defend her positions before a national audience as she faces off against former President Donald Trump. The debate is scheduled to take place at the National Constitution Center in Philadelphia. We can't let him lead our country again. I'm Kamala Harris, and I approve this message. The Harris Walls campaign also releases a new campaign ad. It features ominous warnings about another Trump presidency from former officials in his administration. Now those people have a warning for America. Trump is not fit to be president again. Here's his vice president. Anyone who puts himself over the Constitution should never be president of the United States. It should come as no surprise that I will not be endorsing Donald Trump this year. Where at least I know I'm free. In Wisconsin, the former president at a rally over the weekend president looking ahead to the debate, but not expecting fair coverage of it. Oh, they're waiting for the debate. You know, if I destroy her in the debate, they'll say, Trump suffered a humiliating defeat tonight, no matter what. He also posted over the weekend that his legal team is watching election security very closely, warning, when I win, those people that cheated will be prosecuted to the fullest extent of the law, which will include long-term prison sentences. Uh, this is concerning, particularly for all those folks out there uh, whose integrity is being impugned. Also tonight, a New York Times Siena poll reveals Donald Trump leading Kamala Harris by one point, 48 to 47, although Harris has a slight lead in some battleground states. And we'll know soon enough if tomorrow's debate changes any of those numbers. At the White House, Owen Jensen, EWTN News Nightly. All right, for more on the upcoming debate, let's bring in Dr. Tom Bell, Professor and Political Management Program Director at George Washington University. Professor, good to have you back on. Um, as you heard Owen say, the polls really seem to flatten out for the moment uh, since Harris's initial surge. Why do you think that is? And do you think tomorrow's debate could maybe be a make or break moment for the vice president? Well, thanks. It's good to be with you again. I don't think we need to put too much stock in this most recent poll, even though there was a slight downtick. It was still within the margin of error. And of course, the national polls are not how we elect our president. We use the electoral colleges and the state is what matters. So each of the states. So um, can this debate be important? It certainly can. Uh, it's often said that a debate is not going to win you the election, but it could lose it for you. Just ask Joe Biden. Uh, so, you know, we know that that's certainly the the point. But I think, uh, you know, we know what Donald Trump is. We've had a term with him. 
voters need to be more introduced to Kamala Harris and her policies, what she stands for, and what an America under a Harris administration would look like. Yeah, and speaking of the debate, both sides are preparing in their own way. That said, is there a right or wrong way to prep for a debate, and can you ever be prepared enough? Well, you can almost not be too prepared, but uh, you know, you also don't want to be so overprepared that you're not ready for a good spontaneous moment. Uh, or at least one that looks like a spontaneous moment. We know that most of the undecideds are not going to be watching the debate. It's actually the people who are really committed to one party or another watch the debate to see how their candidate's going to do. The people who are undecided are going to get their news in the next day or two about what happened in the debate. And that's why we're going to see these candidates try to get off these zingers, as we call them, that get replayed over and over, that can try to get their message out that they want voters to hear. And Professor Bell, what do you think each candidate needs to convey during this debate? And what do you think the voters want to hear? Well, I think the voters want to hear exactly what I just said, which is what would you do to make voters' lives better? What is your future plan for America? I mean, like I said, we did have four years under Trump, so we know what he brings, but he hasn't talked too much about what he would do about inflation. He's talked about tariffs, but he's always talked about that and not much else. And Kamala Harris has talked about this opportunity economy, but she hasn't put too much uh, on the uh, skeleton in terms of what it's going to be. She has a uh, something that she's releasing today about some more details. I think people want to hear that. People want to know what the future is like, because after all, elections are about the future. Yeah, and if you were advising either the candidates, what would you tell them to do during the debate? Well, first of all, don't mess up, <laughs> because we know that the election can, can be swung on a very bad debate performance. But the other thing is to actually be forthright and tell people why their lives will be better under your administration than your opponents. All right, we're going to leave it right there. Professor Bell, great to be with you as always. Thank you so much. Great to be on. Thank you. All right, well, Congress is back with a final three-week sprint before the November elections, and once again, they are battling the clock to keep the government open past October 1st. But House Speaker Mike Johnson's plan to avert a shutdown has already drawn skepticism from some Republicans and opposition from Democrats. Capitol Hill correspondent Eric Rosales joins us with a preview of what's ahead. Eric. Well, good evening, Tracy. Yes, Speaker Johnson's plan basically involves two parts. First, it'll keep the government funded until next March, but it would also want the bill that would require citizenship for, uh, in order to be able to register to vote in all federal elections. It's known as the SAVE Act. Senate Republicans think passing it, along with the Speaker, says part of any funding bill is a no-brainer, and it needs to pass. When you take the polls, you look at a poll on this, about 87% of American citizens believe you ought to be able to acquire proof of citizenship. You should have to before you register to vote. So it's unconscionable to me that anybody in this building would vote against that or suggest that it's politics. And, uh, and some people are going to say there is no issue whatsoever. Uh, we don't need it. Well, if there isn't an issue, pass it. Uh, if, if, if it is not a problem anywhere in the nation, it won't inconvenience anybody. But House Speaker Mike Johnson is already facing pushback over the plan. At least two GOP lawmakers have come out against it. Congressman Thomas Massey says he won't vote for the bill. And Matt Rosendale criticized it as a messaging bill on social media. It's wrong in trying to get it attached because we know it's not going to get passed. It's disingenuous and it's dishonest to even attach it to that CR. And secondly, it violates the very rules that we fought to put in place, which says that you have to have single subject legislation. Democrats claim Speaker Johnson is bowing to pressure from Republican House Freedom Caucus members. Senate Majority Leader Chuck Schumer and Appropriations Committee Chair Patty Murray issued a joint statement writing in part, quote, if Speaker Johnson drives House Republicans down this highly partisan path, the odds of a shutdown go way up and Americans will know that the responsibility of a shutdown will be on the House Republicans' hands. The Republicans start off with these poison pill riders on their suggestion for government funding. It turns out that not even their own caucus usually is in favor of their leadership's proposals. Um, those end up dying. 
It is important to note that House Republican leadership is planning a Wednesday floor vote on a continuing resolution, but there's still a lot of uncertainty that that's going to happen or if it will pass. Democrats say that the plan is dead on arrival as soon as it hits the Senate, and President Biden has said that he plans to veto the measure if it gets to his desk. Tracy. Well, Eric, I want to uh, switch to another subject. Now, I understand there are several reports out regarding the deadly and chaotic U.S. withdrawal from Afghanistan. What more can you tell us about that? Yeah, the GOP report comes years after its investigation by Republicans on the House Foreign Affairs Committee. They were looking into the botched withdrawal of Afghanistan. They accused the uh, President Biden and his administration of demanding a U.S. exit from Afghanistan no matter the cost. It claims that the administration prioritized optics over personal safety. You may recall during that withdrawal from Afghanistan, 13 U.S. service members were killed and left thousands of Afghans who had worked with the United States. Many of them were later murdered. Now, meanwhile, Democrats released a report of their own accusing the GOP chairman of pursuing a predetermined partisan narrative in the investigation. White House National Security spokesman John Kirby calls the report a false narrative and claims the Biden administration did prepare for withdrawal. Planning that started in the spring of 2021 and included all the requisite agencies. In fact, the Department of Defense pre-positioned military units in the region so that once a decision had been reached to evacuate, they would be poised to respond in a timely fashion. Kirby adds that the fall of Afghanistan uh, forces moved a lot faster than anyone anticipated, and there was no point in securing the Bagram Air Base during the evacuation. That would have required thousands of more additional U.S. troops. Chairman McCall is planning a hearing next week and has subpoenaed Secretary of State Antony Blinken to appear before the committee. I'll be at that hearing, and I'll bring you the latest. Tracy. All right. Thank you so much, Eric, for that. All right. Now to the Middle East, where more than a dozen people are dead following Israeli strikes overnight into Syria. All this comes as the Israeli military ordered another evacuation of some residential areas in northwest Gaza. Israel claims Palestinian militants fired rockets on a nearby town. Meanwhile, dozens attended the funeral procession for a Turkish-American activist who witnesses say was killed last week in a protest in the West Bank. Well, China's defense ministry announces that it will hold joint naval and air drills with Russia. Beijing says the exercises are aimed to improve strategic cooperation and deal with with, quote, national security issues. The Chinese and Russian navies will cruise together in the Pacific for the fifth time. And we have a lot more still to come here on EWTN News Nightly, including finding fires, a closer look at blazes in Bolivia and California, and why a police officer is on administrative leave after a run-in with a star player from the Miami Dolphins. All the faithful in Bolivia gather around the Blessed Virgin Mary to pray for rain. This comes as a South American country is battling massive forest fires. Meanwhile, 5,000 volunteers are trying to stop the blazes from advancing. With the fire and smoke, the government declared a national emergency. And in California, a wildfire has forced hundreds of residents to flee amid a heat wave of triple digit temperatures. The fire burned so hot on Saturday that it created its own thunderstorm like weather system bringing gusty winds and lightning strikes. San Bernardino County officials declared an emergency issuing mandatory evacuation orders. State officials say that three firefighters have been injured and more than 35,000 structures were threatened. And joining us now is John Neese, associate head for undergraduate programs in the Department of Meteorology and Atmospheric Science at Penn State. University. He was also a former storm analyst with the Weather Channel and chief meteorologist at the Franklin Institute. John, good to be with you again. Um, so give us an update on the wildfire and where things stand right now. Yeah, thanks for having me. Well, it's actually been a fairly typical fire season in California in terms of the number of fires and the number of acres burned when you compare what has happened this year to the five-year average. But um, of course, whether it's average or above average doesn't matter to those who are, being effect who are being affected. It looks like there's still about seven what they consider big blazes 
burning in California right now and uh, between 60 and 70 big fires in the western United States. All right. I know we're still kind of in that season as well, too. Yes. Uh, no word yet, John, on what caused this fire. Uh, but we do know that the high temperatures enabled the fire to increase. What needs to happen now weather-wise to get this under control? Well, first of all, indeed, the causes are of these fires are often just lightning, that lightning produces the fires. And some of them, of course, are, are uh, man-made. But you need the heat to be toned down, which will happen in the next couple days. And you don't want there to be much wind. Those two things alone should give firefighters the edge. Yeah, I understand uh, the heat and the smoke from the fire helped to create something called, and I hope I'm pronouncing this correctly, uh, pyrocumulonimbus. Uh, what is that? Explain that phenomenon to us. Yeah, excellent pronunciation. Yeah, pyro meaning fire. And cumulonimbus is sort of the official cloud name that meteor meteorologists have for a thunderstorm. So a pyrocumulonimbus is a thunderstorm cloud that develops above something very hot. And in most cases, it's a fire. So the fire heats the air, the air rises to great heights, and you get a thunderstorm. How rare is that? Well, the fire has to be extremely hot for the air to rise high enough to get a thunderstorm. So I would it's not rare. But it's, it's not typical. I think it's also interesting to note that when that happens, the thunderstorms themselves um, produce rain, produce lightning, and they can produce their own wind, which can create more havoc at the ground. Yeah, and, and you mentioned this, uh, but quickly a recap. You know, what are the weather conditions looking like over the next few days, and could it impact firefighting efforts? Is it going to get better for them? It will. I think by Wednesday, the heat wave will be over, but I think there's probably one more really hot day. All right. We're going to leave it right there. John, thank you so much for your insights. Always appreciate it. My pleasure. All right. In Vietnam, dozens of people are dead after super typhoon Yagi makes landfall. The storm brings with it heavy rains, sand flooding, and startling dash cam video right here shows the moment a major bridge collapsed. You see it right there. Just startling. Reports say 10 cars and trucks along with two motorbikes plunged into the river. That is unbelievable. One survivor says that he managed to swim and hold on to a drifting banana tree before being rescued. All right, now to the National Football League. A police officer is now on administrative leave after he handcuffed Miami Dolphins star Tyreek Hill and placed him on the ground only hours before the team's season opener. The Dolphins wide receiver was pulled over for speeding and reckless driving on a street outside the Hard Rock Stadium yesterday. Fans captured the video showing Hill on the ground right there. He says uh, he is confused why the officer used such force. The NFL star adds that he respects police officers and actually wants to be one when he retires from football. Up next on EWTN News Nightly, a fraternity to heal the world. 4,000 people gather at the International Eucharistic Congress in Ecuador. Plus, the Holy Father makes the next stop on his 12-day trip to Asia and Oceania. Pope Francis says that he is spiritually united with the faithful in Kenya after a school fire left 21 boys dead and many more injured. The blaze broke out in a dormitory housing boys from 5th to 8th grades. The Holy Father commends the souls of the students to God's loving mercy. The editor-in-chief of ACI Africa has more. This is a fire that uh, happened in an academy in central Kenya in the Catholic Archdiocese of Nyeri a school that um, has 330 pupils, um, girls and boys. The fire was on the boys' dormitory. And um, the latest update is that um, all the boys have been accounted for. 21 of them perished in the fire, 19 of them on the scene, but two of them succumbed to their injuries. Well, Kenya's President William Ruto declared three days of mourning to begin today. Flags will be flown at half-staff throughout the East African country.
Well, after a four-day visit to Papua New Guinea, Pope Francis has arrived in East Timor, the third leg of his apostolic journey to Asia and Oceania. EWTN Vatican journalist Benedict Sidegren gives us a closer look at the Pope's last few days and memorable encounters. Pope Francis is more than halfway through his visit to Southeast Asia. On Friday evening, the Holy Father landed in Papua New Guinea, where he met with the country's authorities and diplomats, as well as bishops and Catholic leaders. Pope Francis also traveled to the coastal city of Vanimo, where no pope has ever been before. He brought with him toys, clothing, medicine, and other necessities to help people live in, in their remote area. In his address to the faithful of Vanimo, the Holy Father praised the work of the missionaries who have been evangelizing the area since the 19th century. You are doing something beautiful, and it is important that you are not left alone. The entire community needs to support this effort so that you can carry out your service serenely. Before boarding his next flight, Pope Francis addressed an estimated 10,000 young people in a stadium, following a colorful welcome dance by a group of young people dressed in traditional attire. Pope Francis explained that he couldn't leave Papua New Guinea without meeting them, because the young are a hope for the future. Thank you for your joy and for recounting the beauty of Papua, where the ocean meets the sky, where dreams are born and challenges vanish. Above all, thank you for setting before all of us a hopeful desire to face the future with smiles of hope. Earlier this morning, the Holy Father landed in East Timor, the only nation on his itinerary where Catholics are the overwhelming majority. As he traveled to the Apostolic Nunciature, crowds of people lined the roads cheering him on and waving Vatican flags. One of the highlights of the visit, which is themed, May Your Faith Be With Your Culture, will be tomorrow's Mass, which is expected to be attended by some 700,000 people, including those from neighboring Indonesia and Australia. In Rome, Benedictia de Grian, EWTN News Nightly. And finally tonight, the International Eucharistic Congress is underway in Ecuador. The event-filled week includes prayer meetings, adoration before the Blessed Sacrament, and Eucharistic processions. EWTN Vatican journalist Paula Raza has more. May our hearts, but above all our ears, always be open to hear the cry of pain of the whole world, the cry of those who suffer, and the clamor of the poor. And may we, from the Eucharist, be authentic missionaries of fraternity, to heal and work the miracle that we may all be one. Celebrating the opening Mass and calling on the intercession of Our Lady of Quiche, Archbishop Alfredo José Espinosa Mateus, Archbishop of Quito and Primate of Ecuador, opened the 53rd International Eucharistic Congress. The Congress, which continues until Sunday, takes place at the Metropolitan Convention Center and coincides with a very important milestone in the country's history. 150 years ago, Ecuador became the first nation to consecrate itself to the Sacred Heart of Jesus. Thousands of people attended Sunday's morning opening Mass with delegations from over 40 countries alongside more than 1,500 children who made their first communion during this historic Mass. The Holy Father addressed participants of the Congress by video message, which was aired at the beginning of the celebration. Pope Francis praised the Congress theme, Fraternity to Heal the World, calling on all to recover radical fraternity with God and among men through the Eucharist. He explained that the gift of the Eucharist helps us to become the body of Christ for others. The Church Fathers told us that the sign of bread kindles in the people of God the desire for fraternity. For just as bread cannot be needed from a single grain, so too must we walk together. For though we are many, we are one body, one bread. 
The impact of this event for Ecuador was emphasized in the recent interview with EWTN News by Ecuador's new ambassador to the Holy See, Jorge Mundo Uribe Perez, who said that the Eucharistic Congress is the best thing that could happen to the country at this moment. Mire, a mí me da la impresión de que el país... I have the impression that our country that has become violent is going to stop. I hope so. Because if there is something that can really transform a person, it is not arguments or conflict. Finally, arguments do not change people. What changes people is grace. In Quito, Paola Riaza, EWTN News Nightly. And we thank you for watching tonight. Remember, you can follow us on social media, Facebook, X, and Instagram at EWTN News Nightly. I'm Tracy Sable. Good night and God bless.